Hi, welcome to Zooming the Pandemic, the comics edition, a special for VanCaf. My name is Denny Lubert, and I'll be your host for this series. As you probably know, comics has a long and interesting history, and Canada has had a pivotal role in much of it. I'm glad I had a chance to be a part of the indie movement when my ex-husband, Dave Sim, and I published Cerebus the Aardvark, and I founded my own line of comics, Renegade Press. Along the way, I had a chance to meet with, to work with, and to enjoy the work of some really great women cartoonists. When Van Caff asked me if I would like to create a series where I would interview a handful of women whose work I've continued to enjoy, I of course jumped at the chance. Join us as we talk about the 70s and the 80s, a time when the independent comics were beginning to emerge and comics medium itself was beginning to change. We will explore the challenges that many of these women faced as well as the innovative changes that happened in the comics medium itself as it became part of mainstream. We begin our journey with Mary Wilshire, from her powerhouse stint on Marvel Comics' Red Sonja to the iconic work that she did for the Blues Brothers. Mary has always delivered a look that is both feminine and truly accessible. We got together over Zoom the other day to catch up on each other's lives, to talk about those heady days of the 70s and 80s in the comics world, and also to touch a little bit on how the pandemic has been affecting our lives. Join us. It's kind of embarrassing to say it, but I never set out to be involved in comics. Um, okay. there, there were uh, strips that I really liked when I was a kid that I really liked to look at in the paper, Apartment 3G. Um, Ooh, that was my, I wanted to do be apartment 3G when I was well, a kid. Well, they, they really zeroed in on, you know, the American girl's fantasy of how to grow up and be independent and yeah. have this exciting, glamorous life. And I think even when I was an independent single woman living in the city, I was still fantasizing, hoping that somehow that fantasy would occur for me. But, but it, you know, life is different. Yes. <laughs> it's not fantasy. But, you know, I, I just wanted to draw. I wanted to draw people, and I wanted to draw people in the way that I like to draw them, which is with a lot of expression. And, you know, the idea of drawing sequences of pictures where people, where you have a chance to illustrate the way people react to each other or situations and with their facial expressions and with their body language. Um, you know, that was what really interested me. And, and I was lucky. I got uh, hooked into a situation where, you know, I had somebody mentoring me. And um, I didn't realize how much work it was going to be. And I, you know, in doing some of the research that I did in the last couple of days so that I could have a better idea of what everybody else is doing. You know, I was amazed to see the people I remember working with. Um, and how much work they've been doing over the years. And I've been working too. I've just been working in a different way. Right. And, you know, I don't know if I will do comics again. Um, but if I do, it's going to have to be, you know, exactly the way I want to do it. And the good news seems to be there is tons of stuff out there being done by women. I just got so tired of having to fight for, you know, my way of looking at things and my way of drawing and, I was never allowed to ink anything, you know, when I was at Marvel because, you know, they just couldn't explain to me how I was supposed to be doing it. Um, and I tried, I did learn a lot, um, but I, I just wasn't, I didn't really fit the Marvel mold. And I wish that I had known that there was a Joe Kubert school that close to where I was growing up in New Jersey because Maybe that's where I should have gone if I wanted to learn, you know, where I think Jan Dersima went there and I know Bill Sienkiewicz went there. I mean, I always loved the graceful line that you had in your art. And it really came back to me looking at some of your stuff that there's a kind of, I mean, grace is the only really word I can think of. There, it has a real illustrative feel, feel. It has a flow to it, the line work that you do. And that could get lost doing the Marvel DC form of ink work. Well, you know. Much more angular it, and male and power. You know, when I was looking through some of the work that's, you know, being recommended, that's out, coming out now, and 
what's out and what's popular, I was uh, really struck by, you know, I was looking for the women creators and women writers and artists mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, the, all this wonderful stuff. And I could see that women are, you know, it really does seem to be like a common denominator that women are more interested in relationship, mm -hmm. in responses, in interaction, in connection, and in the kinds of stories that that develop out of relationship and situations, you know. But it is it is wonderful to see how much work is out there, and how um, yeah. and how and much stuff is being done by women, and, and how much of it seems to be about really, you know, really interesting, a wide range of really interesting kinds of stories and yeah. experiences and voices. So such a wider breadth now of what's out there. But let's go back for a minute to my questions. <laughs> so, because, you know, one of the things I found interesting, and uh, this is the fun thing about doing Zoom interviews, is you learn things about people you think you know, is I didn't know that you had a fine arts degree from Pratt, which to me kind of, you know, I'd it kind of explains some of your approach, especially when I look at some of the stuff that I was looking at getting ready for this interview. But also, um, what kind of things did you study out at Pratt um, that you think informed your art, you, you, you as an artist, comics or otherwise, um, later on? Oh, that's hard for me to say because I applied to several different art schools. I really wanted to go to RISD and all the schools that I applied to rejected me except Pratt. <laughs> and, I didn't realize how much of a cartoony illustrative style I had. I thought maybe I, I'd be a fashion illustrator, but it, it took decades before anyone, before I was able to realize that I was much more interested in drawing the people wearing the garments than the garments themselves. <laughs> and no one was able to tell me that. And I didn't really, you know, I got to Pratt. I um, probably the thing that made more of a difference than anything to me was to be in a community of creative people who were all completely unique and all completely dedicated to their artistic path. Um, that was so nourishing and so mind opening for me in a lot of ways. Uh, but I'm a late bloomer. And when I got out of college, I had no clue, no clue. So I was literally looking at, um, you know, ads in the newspaper and just trying to chase down every, you know, I was drawing, for a while I was drawing t-shirts. I, I was a portrait sketcher on the boardwalk in, in Wildwood, New Jersey for a couple of summers. Um, and that was fun. I, I didn't really know what I was doing though. And I was lucky that I just somehow, managed to fall in with some interesting people and one thing led to another and I got the Blues Brothers job. And okay. How did you end up doing, doing work for Last Gas? Because you were on the East Coast and they were on the West Coast. Well, I knew, let's see, I guess I was going to parties that had a lot of crazy cartoon types. <laughs> and, um, and that was where I can't even remember, but it was Trina who gave me my first job, you know, who gave me a chance to do a comic. And I had no idea what I was doing. And um, I did it anyway. And it was, you know, it was really fun. And uh, it's something that I hope no one will ever see again. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they, as long as I live. Um, but, you know, that was the beginning. And then I had, you know, then I, then there was Larry and Larry Hama and he, gave me a shot at drawing Red Sonia and he literally taught me on the job, um, you know, how to, to, how to approach continuity and um, I really enjoyed it. It was really fun and he got incredible inkers to ink my work. So anything yeah. he didn't understand about what I was drawing got covered up by by the uh, artistry, by the masterful artistry of people like Nestor Redondo or, um, you know, Walt Simonson. And I even had a chance to, you know, Jeff Isherwood, who lives in Canada, uh, inked my stuff. And, and 
Um, you know, wow, it's just you worked with some pretty amazing anchors then. I was so lucky. I was so lucky. And, um, and then I guess at a certain point, you know, but I always wanted to do other things too, you know, so I was going after editorial work. There wasn't quite enough to keep me afloat. And because I wasn't good at drawing weapons or cars or rocket ships or science fiction monsters, um, explosions. And then there was that graphic novel that I was going to draw in pastel about a single woman in the 80s, you know, running around New York City. And the one you sent me some pages from? Yes, I sent you one page. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have some other pages that I, I never finished. Yeah, it um, looked really interesting. It looked very 80s. <laughs> well, I was like looking at it and looking at the clothing and the hair and going like, oh my God, this is, this is so 80s. You could do that now and release it as a flashback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want to have that flashback. <laughs> That's the problem. But, you know, it was, um, I was just incredibly lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. It didn't always feel that way. But, um, you know, if when I had a chance to work for Good Housekeeping doing illustrations, that was like really fun um, for Reader's Digest. And I did a little work for National Lampoon. That was amazing to meet Sherry Flanagan. And I should have paid a lot more attention to her because she was so good. But she got me to the San Diego Comic-Con the first time. And um, I think that was when I met you, was when Sherry I, brought you out. Well, that's, that makes sense. I was so, I was just so flabbergasted. I had, it was, everything there was so far beyond. I just had no idea, you know, there, there was this whole world of people who did this and uh, that I was there with them. And I was very intimidated and very, very nervous. And Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, it was funny, I was kind of going down my own uh, memory lane is was when I pulled out uh, Renegade Romance uh, books that I actually I was used to say I that I created in in a bar at San Diego Comic-Con because a bunch of us were all sitting around going I miss romance stories how come nobody ever does romance stories anymore and I just went okay I'll do a graphic novel of a collection of romance stories if you guys all do one and you did Art Heart for me which I still love. And I was like reading it through and remembering how good that felt when that came in. That well, I, I was just, I was so bummed out that you didn't do more issues because that was exactly the kind of work I wanted to be doing. That you was know, Renegade Went Under. We were, I think Renegade Romance Number 2 was one of the last books I put out. And I was determined to put it out. And that's what yours is in. But that wow. story is so lyrical and it tells such a great story especially the segment, I was looking through the segment, there's like two or three pages in the middle of the story with no words. And I loved that. It's the kind of thing that I wish comics did more of. It's cinematic. Well, I, but aren't there people who are doing that now? I mean... More now, but back then you just didn't see it as much. Then all of a sudden, when the opportunity presented itself, I was suddenly getting married and starting a family, something I never thought I would do. And suddenly my focus was completely elsewhere. Right. I mean, and I did a lot of art, but I did it, you know, for the PTA. I did it for the, you know, the kids projects. I did it for church. Uh, I did it for neighborhood things. I still do it for neighborhood things. Um, but I do, I do think about, I do think about, what kind of material I would like to see comics. And so it was wonderful for you to give me this chance to really dive into, you know, see what's out there. And I'm just um, blown away by the amount of material. And especially when I see the work of people like Raina Telgamir. And she, she writes stories about kids in high school or middle school and the kinds of conflicts they experience and how they navigate that and I just I'm fascinated with that kind of with that aspect of human nature because I feel like I'm still doing it I feel like I'm you know I'm still trying to figure out how to navigate 
my own human nature and and those are the people around me and being in a pandemic yes being in this time now is is such a you unique write about this well i've been right i've been reading the writing you know of some people who are much more coherent and literate than i am and i'm grateful for that writing because it's so tempting to think that the kind of intense thoughts that are not what you're used to thinking about um, are only you and you must be going crazy or there must be something wrong with you that you're looking at things this way. And then to read in the Atlantic or in the New Yorker, um, you know, that a lot of people are feeling that way. I heard somebody say, they'll either come out of the pandemic as a, a chunk, a monk or a drunk. <laughs> because it's just, you know, you could be baking and you can just completely retreat into domestic, you know, insanity. And I know some who have, yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I've done that myself over the years, but this time is different. And it really feels like, I mean, I hope that it's a time when a lot of people can reevaluate the way they want to live their lives. Just say, fantasy, final question. If you were to go to a con now and had an opportunity, somebody said, I'm forming a new company, I'm thinking of bringing some people who used to work in comics back into comics. What kind of a project and with whom would you want to do it? I would love to be able to tell stories about how successful spiritual values can be, but not in a in-your-face kind of a way, um, in a subtle way, maybe with a minimum of dialogue, who knows? <laughs> but it would require working with a writer, you know, who shared those kinds of values. Um, so I really don't know, Danny. And as you're asking me these questions, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I just have to be with these other people. I have to be with other people who, right. uh, who think this yeah. way yeah. in order to be stimulated so that this stuff will come out. I don't pretend to know what's going to happen or even what I'm going to do, but um, I, I do think it's important, you know, and I do think it's important for people to keep, you know, producing this art form. I have to say that I agree with Mary that it's so important that we continue to see new and exciting works in comics. Of course, comics is an art form that always has and will continue to be a unique way to tell a story. Join us next time when I sit down and talk over Zoom with the ever rebellious and very funny and interesting Mary Fleener. Hope you join us then.